funny, she's smart, she craves chocolate every day, and she is the Greek goddess of coffee. Here is your host, Ellen Karras. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Karras's Comedy Corner. My name is Ellen Karras, and you are listening to the guest edition of Karras's Comedy Corner. I have a fantastic guest today. I am so, so excited. I actually had to stop talking before the show because then I was going to talk about everything we were going to talk about. So, uh, but before we begin, you know, we always have to do the ads. So our sponsors, boy, do we love them. And it is Thanksgiving tomorrow. So we are internally grateful to them. Our first sponsor is Baywalk Marketing. Go to their website, baywalk.net for all of your advertising and marketing needs. They can help you with any type of a flyer for your social media, for your business. They can help you analyze the demographics of your business. And they are experts in the Greek community. Go to their website, hollywoodgreeks.com. Find out where all your Greek American entertainment is. Sometimes I'm on there too. Uh, Or hellenicfestivals.org to find out where there is a Greek festival near you. Thank you, Baywalk Marketing. Also, our other sponsor is Select Flex. What is it? It's an orthotic. What's an orthotic? It's also called an insert and you put it in your shoe. Why do you need it? Because your entire body needs it. Everything starts from the feet and works its way up. Your hips, your knees, your shins, your back, your entire alignment. And let me tell you something. I do not walk. I do not work out without these in my shoe. They're fantastic for sneakers, work boots, flat shoes, uh, Ugly. We are now in UGG season. Go to their website, selectflex.com, S-E-L-E-C-T-F-L-E-X.com. There's a 30-second video that shows you how these work. There is a geometric beam in the arch where you can adjust the arch to firm, extra firm, or extra, extra firm, depending on what your needs are. And for Cowers Comedy Corner listeners, there is a 25% discount if you type in the code FAMILY, F-A-M-I-L-Y 25, because you, my listeners, I love like my family, except I don't fight with you guys as much. Uh, So go to their website, check them out. We thank them for their support. Get it? Support. Check them out. They are the greatest things since suitcase on wheels, as I like to say. Okay. Uh, Let's get to our guest. I met her, I will say serendipitously. I didn't say that right, but I'm just going to keep it there because I just want to show you how I mumble my words as well. Um, And it was in the beauty salon chair. Yes, women are still meeting in the beauty salon. That's still a thing. Uh, We were introduced by the owner. She thought we would connect and we did. Immediately, we started talking. Incredibly impressed. Uh, she, she is one of the top divorce lawyers, certainly in New York City, New York State, probably the country. Um, but that is uh, her story now. Her story starts as a mother of four going back to school, law school, after some things happen, and we're going to have her talk about it, uh, and just having this absolutely fabulous career. And I'm just going to start this part also off of the top. One of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why I wanted our fabulous, beautiful guest to be on the show is because her mantra, the one that she's certainly shown us, is age doesn't matter. And I talk a lot on my show, whether I'm doing my my solo ranting or I've got a guest, especially when I have a woman and and as we know, women in comedy, I talk about ageism a lot. It's the one ism that doesn't seem to get enough attention as far as I'm concerned. And there is such a prejudice. Um, And this is a woman that 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 doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And I love I I love that about her. And we're going to hear about her story. So please welcome my guest, lawyer Harriet Cohen. Thank you so much, Ellen. Greek goddess of comedy. That is really wonderful. I don't know whether you know it, but I was a Latin and Greek major when I was at Barnard. In no. those days, when I was just heading into that marriage, graduated on a uh, Wednesday, got married on a Sunday. Oh and God. that's how it was in those days. <laughs> and, I, and I knew uh, Homer, Thucydides. Uh, I, read it, I, I read them all in Greek. Okay, you, 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 
in reading the articles about you, you've been uh, profiled in the Huffington Post, the New York Times just recently, uh, Oprah Daily did a huge article on you. So I got to uh, read a little bit of your background. You grew up in Providence, R Rhode Island. So I you're not, My you're not a born bred New Yorker, but you really, you, you are a New Yorker. You've been here the majority of your life. Funnily enough, uh, Ellen, formative years, so important to children in their development. You know, I'm a custody lawyer and a divorce lawyer. And I think about my own life and what I say and think. Those formative years, that was the whole thing. I may have left there at age 12 and a half, but that never left me. I was always a Providence girl with New England values and uh, the wonderful uh, calmness of the life in, in Providence for a child. Uh, and I took it with me wherever I went. So I made New York City into a Providence. It never seemed too big to me. I just turned it into a small place uh, and I brought my Providence values with me. I love the New England aura. There is something comfortable, um, especially around this time of the year, ar around the holidays, very family oriented. Obviously, there's a lot of history in the Northeast. Uh, it's, it's just something really beautiful. And I do a lot of comedy for Greek churches. And I was just up in Worcester. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's just a, it's a different vibe, a little bit more pulled back, a little bit more laid back, uh, a little bit more in the moment, as opposed to here where we're always thinking five, 10 minutes or an hour ahead of ourselves. It's just, it's just beautiful. And the seasons are also magnificent. I don't know if that does something to somebody's personality. Well, and I, I can tell you when I arrived, I was uh, uh, very chauvinistic about New England. And uh, one of the uh, uh, key moments in my life that I remember always is when I had said one time too many to my eighth grade teacher, raised my hand. I was somewhat precocious, uh, had skipped grades. That's what they did in those days. And Providence had a fabulous educational system. And I raised my hand and said, that's not how we do it in Providence. And she said to me, Harriet, if you say that one more time, so I never said it again, but I thought it the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you came down here when you were 12. Yes. Your, your family moved down to New York City yes. mm -hmm. and you went to uh, Barnard College. I did. I did. And I, I was a, a day student. I brown bagged it, as they say. I traveled back and forth from my home in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. my parents' home in Brooklyn, to Barnard up at 116th Street. I'd open what we called in those days the Green Gate. I'd close the Green Gate behind me, and I was in a different world. So there I was at Barnard. Uh, I had graduated from James Madison High School at the top of my class, I guess, so I was the salutatorian. And um, for my parents, it would have been nice if I had gone away to school because then they wouldn't have had to hear me every weekend saying to them, oh, that's not right. No, no, you're not, you're not <laughs> thinking that. No. All of a sudden, I thought I was really, really miss know it all. I came to understand that my parents were brilliant and uh, they had to put up with me for those four years. Did you have siblings? I'm the oldest of four. And then I had four. So... Let's talk oh, about that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so you married your high school sweetheart. Is I that, did. Is that correct? Right. And so you and so you and then you dated through college and then got married the day after you graduated. College. Exactly. Exactly. And we were together for 21 years, 21 years. Uh, but we grew apart during that period of time. I was in the second year of law school at Brooklyn Law School. We can come back to that in a minute mm -hmm. when that marriage uh, terminated. My husband told me uh, he didn't want to live there anymore. He took one suitcase and he started walking out the door. Uh, I, like you see in the movies, I grabbed onto his ankles uh, and he walked and he dragged me. And I said, you can't leave us. You can't leave us. What am I going to do with these four girls? And he said to me, you will do just fine. So that's another one of the things in my life that I remember. Wow. And we did. We did just fine. Wow. So so while you were you were raising your you were full time. I mean, four kids is, you know, is enough, but uh, is more than enough. But uh, so you full time mom, school. Right. Lunches. So I'll take you back for a moment because I know you told me you'd like to hear a little history. Uh, my high school sweetheart and I discovered 
very shortly after the marriage, it's very funny how that happens, that um, we weren't that compatible. I guess we were quite immature, although I thought I knew it all. And uh, we began to not see eye to eye very, very early. And I realized I had my first child very, very uh, quickly. Uh, I was very young and I didn't know an awful lot about a lot about life. And therefore 13 or so months after getting married, there was that wonderful first baby who knew about you know, how to really take care of family planning. Uh, and I realized that my husband was not gonna be my best friend. I just knew it, I felt it. Uh, not about disloyalty, not about uh, cheating, just I could see that uh, it wasn't gonna be great. So I said to myself, Harriet, you need friends. So where are the best friends? I found them in my own family. My mother and father had four children. We had a wonderful, wonderful household. So I said to myself, you're gonna have four children. You're gonna have four friends. Don't worry about how he feels. You're married for life. And these are your friends and that's your husband. And that's what I did. So, so when this, this moment came, when your husband left you, um, as a complete shock, right? Surprise, or did you sort of knew deep down inside? You're a very intuitive person, clearly. Did you ever think, or, or like what was going through your head? Great, great question. I'm sure the people who share this podcast have lived through and have thought about those things. I say that it was a great shock, but if I am going to be truly, truly honest, I guess it started the day I realized he wasn't my best friend. So I must have known somewhere in the back of my head that I was going to stay forever, but he might not. Mm -hmm. But it was a great shock uh, because I thought we were just going to live that way in, shall we call it disharmony? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, so, and But, but, but uh, he gave me the keys to my freedom. It's something I wouldn't have done but it's something I should have done. My children are daughters. My oldest daughter, who is only 20 years younger than me, is my partner at law. My number two daughter, who's only two and a half years younger than her, is a professional flutist, but she is our office manager. She works 24 seven, as does my other daughter, as do I. We have a very, very busy law practice, family law. And uh, we come into the office. We started coming in very shortly after the pandemic when uh, Governor Cuomo said it was okay to go back. We were the first ones back. We are 24 seven, all of us, because that's the way my mom raised us, my mom and dad, that's the way I raised them. And it really, really, and that's the way Greek people are. And, and I'm, I'm first generation American. And mm -hmm. I installed those, instilled those uh, values of a hard work ethic into my children, all four of my children. And two of them, I'm so thrilled, work with me. The, your, what is your background, your ethnicity? Jewish. Mm -hmm. And my parent, my mom came from Poland, which at Poland. the time was owned by Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad came from Ukraine, which at the time was also Russia. Mm -hmm. So that's my background. Eastern, Eastern Europe. How about you? Yeah. Uh, um, I, my parents were born here. My mother's side is Cypriot and my father's side is, I'll say Sparta, but it's really Mani. So, yeah. Uh, but yes, we are very Greek <laughs> in many ways through the American, lo I love this country oh, and, yeah. and all of that. My grandparents came through Ellis Island. Yes, uh, my, all, my, all that. my mother and father both came through Ellis Island. I love this country. Yes. I think you and I are on the same page. Yes. Um, so you were in law school when your husband left you, when he- uh, One yeah. week before my second year exams. Okay. And, so and I, yes. And you, but you also started law school, obviously, not when you were 24. You were already a mom of four. Well, that's so, a story there. How, 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 was, how was that? And especially, and let's just bring everybody back, uh, although sometimes not that much has changed. But in this particular case, you were older, you were a mom, you were around everybody that was in their early 20s. You know, so what was that like? And you just... For you, I mean, first of all, you you applied later on, and then you went. I mean, how was the atmosphere then? For so that? I had been out of Barnard. I, I had gotten a master's as well the following year. Okay. My daughter Marty, my law partner, she came along together with the masters. Uh, <laughs> got married, went went to Bryn Mawr for a masters in in the classics and Latin and Greek. Got the masters one year later. Everything on the fast track, baby, um, and. Uh, 
Uh, and I was supposed to be a Latin professor at college. That was what I was heading into. But uh, I had to be at home, not had to be, but wanted to be at home to raise my children. In fact, when I graduated from Barnard, having been on the debate team, I debated Princeton, I debated Yale, but the uh, Barnard women in those days, we did not go to law school and to medical school. We were probably going to be teachers. I was going to be a teacher not in the K to six or K to eight because I was a, such a scholar. I would be a professor at, at, a, at a college, but still a teacher, a teacher. So um, uh, I stayed home with the children. I debated my girlfriend at Barnard and she said, a woman has to have a career. This was before we graduated. And I debated and said, no, a woman has to be highly, highly educated. And her education is in order to be able to raise a highly educated next generation. And she should be happy and content at home doing that job and the husband should be the breadwinner. That was where I came from. By the time I had been uh, 18 years out of college, uh, I realized that uh, it wasn't enough. And I, I felt I was still young. I was 38 years old. And uh, I reached out and applied to law school. It was, uh, I, I went into law school in 1971, 18 years after I had graduated from Barnard and uh, decided to have that career. I discussed it with my husband. Uh, he said words to the effect of over my dead body. Uh, I gave that a lot of thought. I went to my wonderful parents and I said, I'd like you to give me an advance on whatever you're going to do someday when you die. Don't ever die, but I need $800 because uh, my husband is not supportive. I want to go to law school um, and I'd like you to give me my first year's tuition. And uh, the parents said to me, well, the money is not the issue. The issue is uh, if you do that, he's going to leave you. I said to them, if he leaves me, I better have gone to law school because I'm <laughs> going to need to be able to support right. myself. And uh, I said to uh, them as, as well, if you think that he's going to leave me, I mean, it was obvious all through the marriage that he had, that he was malcontent. He never seemed happy. Um, so there's something noisy outside my office. I, I'm I, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I hear a clicking. Is that, is there a clicking sound? There was a click. A uh, is that? I don't know. Let me sit there quietly okay okay good yeah I, okay. there is a uh, fire engine outside i don't know if that's a problem okay in any event i said if you think he's going to leave me then i'd better go to law school mm -hmm. and the second thing they said my mom said to me they were brilliant my parents my mom said to me uh uh this is not your turn this is the children's turn you should not go to school now they should go to school now and i said we're going to go to school together so i didn't listen to their advice and I applied to and was accepted at Brooklyn Law School. I made the law review and uh, the rest of the picture was a career that uh, just uh, skyrocketed from the very, very beginning. When you were in law school, did you have any idea of what law you wanted to get in, into or did you, was it divorce right away or, or because of your experience or, or you, you just, you wanted, you found yourself, like what was that? What was that journey? <clears throat> the journey was, it laid itself out. I, mm. it, it just laid itself out. Uh, I was a very, very good student as I had been all my life. And I was on the law review and they lectured us and said, uh, you women, whatever you do, don't go into the women's professions. Don't go into the uh, t and &E, that's uh, trusts and estates and don't go into matrimonial law. You go into corporate or go into something else. And I took that to heart, but I had such a calling. I was so good at the course that's called domestic relations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had an affinity to my professor who encouraged me in, in that direction. A uh, wonderful, wonderful professor. Uh, and uh, I started as a generalist and I was trying to listen to the voices that had told me go into one of the men's fields uh, so that you can make a name for yourself in a men's field. And I just had an affinity for matrimonial and family law. And yes, I had just come out of my own situation and I had all of that to work with. It was really a crash course in family law, uh, emotional, legal, everything that happens to all of my clients that happened to me 
and uh, and it, it did make a huge difference. But I just found myself um, gravitating towards this field. And then I had an incredible opportunity to go to work for a leader in this field, a man by the name of Louis Neiser. He was a luminary at the time that I graduated from law school. And uh, a woman named Julia Perlis. She was a tough, tough woman. And uh, she headed his department. And boy, did I learn a lot from those two. It was just totally amazing. And, and, and again, you're, you're raising your family, you're, you've got this career, you're more mature than some of your other contemporaries. And again, we're in a, we were in a different time, although I don't think it's changed as much, uh, as much as I would like it to, but you know, so how was all that? How did people treat you? Or, I mean, you are an inc incredibly focused, laser focused person. Um, and I'm, I'm listening to you. And I mean, how are, are you able to, what I say, weed out the noise in your head from what's going on around you and just know that you have a, a, a job to do, a, a mission to do, and we're put on this earth to do lots of things. So I had a tremendous advantage over everybody else. What was happening when I got out of law school in 1974? the age of 41. First of all, it's very, very young. All this experience behind me, I got along famously with my 24 year old colleagues in law school. We loved each other. It was just, it was just fabulous. Uh, and with my professors. So there I am. The law in matrimonial law is just changing during the 70s and up until 1980. The law all over the country underwent a change. Title didn't control anymore. Alimony was going out the window. Custody was beginning to be no longer uh, tender years presumption for mothers. Fathers were kind of stepping up to the plate or they were using the fact that there was this thing in California called joint custody, where if there was a divorce, the father didn't just move out. There was a split, the children went to two houses, it was an experiment, all of this was happening. And in New York, Julia Perlis, who I was working with, became known as the mother of equitable distribution, because as the law changed in New York, and as we went from being a title state to being an equitable distribution state, as we moved into the new century, I was at her side, I was at every single meeting, and now we had a new law. None of the old lawyers knew how to use it. They were stuck in the mud with the old law. I was a brand new lawyer, having just taken all these scholarly, wonderful courses in law school. Law school was a dream. It was wonderful, scholastically, intellectually. Uh, I had been to Barnard, I had been to Bryn Mawr, but when I got to Brooklyn Law School, what an education I got and how to think and how to analyze what's a fact and what's an opinion. I found myself going to dinner parties and hearing people speak to each other. And just like I had bothered my parents years earlier, now I'm looking at all these people saying they don't know what they're talking about. They don't have the facts. They haven't really thought through the issues. But having gone to law school, I knew how to do all of that. And um, I was 41, looking good knowing everything, sitting next to the mother of equitable distribution. And I would show up somewhere. And I really was like a, a star in the firmament. And, and people gravitated towards me because I seemed to be very, very knowledgeable and very experienced. I had been in the law for about five months. So I had a real advantage being in the right place at the right time, at the right age. Also Roe versus Wade was decided just exactly then, uh, the early 1970s is when morality changed. Women began to act like men. They were able to participate fully in life before getting married, no more fear of pregnancy and everything changed. Wow. Um, <laughs> now you personally got married a second time. Is that correct? I did. I and did then, one year mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. my husband took the one suitcase and dragged me across the floor with me not letting go of his heels and pleading with him to stay. I met a, 
extraordinary, extraordinary man. I met an extraordinary man, a widower, a doctor, an internist, a very fine, wonderful graduate of uh, Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. And I had worried when my husband left about what was the rest of my life going to look like. I, th I thought I was going to be fine with the career. And I thought my children, we would work through the sense of loss and abandonment, even though it wasn't such a happy household with him there. Still, you know, it's a rejection. Uh, and I thought, who is ever going to come into my life? I still felt like a very young woman. With me, with these four children, my children were all minors. And uh, there were a lot of them, and they were all girls. And, and I met this wonderful man who felt that he was getting something greater because of the fact that I had these four girls. So, and he himself had two children, a little bit older than mine, just a little bit older, like steps. Uh, I don't mean step children, I mean like steps on a staircase. And um, we fell madly in love from the very first date. And uh, we were together for 32 years after that. Where did you meet? Um, well, I called him up in 1974. Because right, there was no online dating. Unless, oh, did, no online dating. Did anybody, well, I, I, and by the way, I didn't online date either. I met my husband, uh, you know, in person. Um, but did you meet at a party? Did somebody fix you up? We were fixed up. But, okay. the, fix, but the fix up was a little complicated. Um, my girlfriend, um, uh, where near where I lived said to me about uh, three months after the first husband had left, uh, she said, Harriet met a wonderful guy last night at a dinner party. In those days it was all dinner parties and all couples met a wonderful guy at a dinner party uh, last night. Um, and uh, I think you'd probably like him. I think he might like you. I said, well, uh, what's his name? What does he do? She told me, I said, well, can you have him call me? And she said, he's not ready. Now she had never met the guy before. I said, well, what do you mean she, he's not ready? Well, he lost his wife in March and, and he's not ready. I said, I, I agree, I agree. I, my husband had left in March. He had lost his wife in March and he wasn't ready. Every time I saw my girlfriend, I'd say to her, is that guy ready? She said, no, he, he's not ready, he's not ready. So the following June, I graduated from law school. Um, I think I was within the first handful. So I was very high up. I was feeling, I mean, I was uh, one of the top graduates. I got honors and awards and it was really quite thrilling. And I was really, really feeling pretty good about myself. So that was on a Friday. And I spent the weekend, whatever I did. And on Monday, I think it was June 17th, 1974. I said to myself, Harriet, she is never going to introduce you to this man. She doesn't even know if he's ready. She met him for the first time. And she's making all these presumptions. You know his name. You know where his practice is. You know he's a doctor. You know where he is. I, and you can look up in the yellow pages where his medical practice is. Call him up. <laughs> Call him up. So I picked up the phone and I dialed him and he answered Dr. So-and-so. And, -so. and um, I said, you don't know me, but, and an hour later, he said, it was nice talking to you. And we both hung up. My children were in other parts of the house and they heard me let out, um, oh my God. They came in and said, well, what's wrong? What happened? I said, I just made the biggest fool of myself. I just called this guy, we had all, and, and he, didn't, he didn't ask for any kind of follow-up. I'm humiliated. And the next day he called me and we met a few days after that and we were never apart for 32 years. Oh it, was, it was just a beautiful, oh beautiful God. love story. Oh, and, and he, he loved he my girls. He walked my girls down the aisle. And then one day after we had been courting for nine years because he had two children, he had lost a wife, there were emotional issues. And um, I, he had always said to me, he was not going to marry again. And having now moved into the new world uh, where all the young women were um, living together before marriage. And here I was, I was a, re, uh, a retread, but kind of picking up the mores of the, of the times. Uh, I traveled with him to his medical meetings. Everybody knew that we were together. Um, and one day he said to me, would you like to get married? And I said, I would. And then we, we eloped and we came back and told our children we were married.
<laughs> and and you said you were together for 32 years. Yeah, and then I lost to me died. And then it lost. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So so um you know, so interesting because you had you had the you had the, the first marriage, which was a, a combination of, of of course you were very young. So that you know that that's got its own set of circumstances. We were children when we right, married. Right, we were right, children. Right. By the time I was 20 and he was 23, can you believe it? We had a little baby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it was, it was, as I look back on it, it was uh, so, I mean, people don't do that anymore today, mostly. Right. And uh, I think with maturity, it, it gets a little bit easier to handle a situation like that. I would say we burdened ourselves very, very young. And while we grew with our children and our children didn't hold me back, not, not whatsoever, uh, but my husband had malaise and that house full of children. It was just something he wasn't ready for. But so you, so you had this, you know, this first marriage that, that had its challenges. And then you had this beautiful love story of yes. a second marriage. Yes. So here and, and now, but here your, your profession, your career, your, you know, your, your big, huge part of your life is divorce. Yes. So I, I mean, in just listening, you know, somebody coming to you. So like, so let's just kind of move a little bit forward to, you know, you know, a little bit more current or the last 20 years. Well, you know, I'm sorry, let me just ask you one question. When did you open your own practice to do this on your own? Well, I headed departments for large firms, okay. but um, ultimately, and, and I was part, I was partnered there. So I was owner, I had ownership in large firms. Mm -hmm. And then I made the decision that we wanted to have our own matrimonial firm in uh, 1990. Um, 1992, I think. Okay, so early, early 90s. Mm -hmm. 30, so 30, so 30 years. Yeah. So it feels, it feels like a minute. <laughs> <laughs> feels like a minute. So when when couples come to you, I mean, you you know, aside from obviously from on a professional level, but on a personal level, yes. you have so much experience. Do you find yourself? Uh, giving personal advice, like how do you? I get my my question. My real question is like, how do you separate Harriet Cohen, the wife, mom, uh, from your client situation? How, you know, how does it not get personal? So this is a very personal practice, whether it's a man or a woman, whether it's a celebrity or somebody from uh, State Street. Um, it's very, very personal. The, my clients are all in extremis. As my doctor husband used to say, he saw his patients in extremis. And then he ended up going to the funerals and getting kudos for having been so kind and loving and caring and professional. Uh, and I see people in extremists. The fact that I have lived it all, including a good second chapter, you can't imagine, Ellen, how uh, encouraging that is when I have weeping people in front of me sometimes discarded the way I had been. I was a discarded spouse and I have discarded spouses coming in. And then I have spouses who can't tolerate a bad situation any longer. And I do share with them, as I'm sharing with you and with your public, uh, some of the uh, contours of my own life. And I tell them that there's happiness out there and that you may find yourself in a very, very healthy, happy place uh, coming up. You don't want to be with a person who doesn't want to be with you. Mm -hmm. The law provides you with rights, obligations, and rights. And let's just get you through this and, uh, and define what the legal part of your life is going to look like. The rest of your life may be very wonderful. If you you know, have my experience, you're going to have a wonderful second chapter. So I, I think it's very, very helpful to my clients. So we know, and so me, I just tell you personally, I, I, I've, I've never been divorced. I'm, my, I'm married 12 years. I was with my husband a long time beforehand. Uh, I was petrified of getting married in my 20s and thereabouts. Uh, I did have a few long relationships. I am glad that I never married those people because I would have been divorced, no question about it. 
um, uh, God brought me just the greatest human ever. And I'm grateful every day. So, um, and I waited, I waited and I, and, and not only did I wait personally, but I waited with him waited, you know, yes. um, but, but, I will but say getting that, there, but getting there is half the fun. The courtship was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I do say to people that, you know, if I had to spew any advice that, you know, it's, I know for my husband and I, we really became great friends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the other thing too, and I could say it to this day, I trust my husband implicitly. I've never caught him in a lie. And, and I trust to me is just the bedrock of, of, of everything. So um, you know, so if there's suspicion, if they're sneaking around, if, and, and I mean, you know, and like big things, it just, it just reeks, but, um, but in, in what, but a, but since I haven't experienced it myself per se, uh, but I've seen a lot of it. And, uh, I, although not in, not with my parents, my parents, you know, stay together, but with a lot of family members and whatnot, and a, a few things. One, uh, it it all so much comes down to money, and 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 sometimes it's just ego, and it's just of it's a winning. It becomes a game. I mean, you know, you 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 know, <laughs> for the most part, divorces are very ugly. And I just want to tell you one thing. Uh, I have a lot of lawyers in my family. Nobody's in divorce law, and I'll never forget my uncle. I had a conversation with him a long time ago who, who was divorced. And, uh, and I remember him saying him and his partner were there and they said, they did a lot of real estate and, and closings and whatnot. And he said, uh, the one law I would never do is divorce. And, and this is before the cell phone era and whatever. And they were like, they did, they, they, they did a bunch and it was just, it was too, for them, too gut-wrenching. And, you know, what I remember his partner saying, you know, the, 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 the husband comes with like the birth control pills of the wife. And, they, you know, they come with like all this evidence of things that are, you know, bad. And, and they, they were like, we just, we couldn't do it. They go, they go so this, because they were like an all general law firm. And they're like, accept divorce. Like we cannot handle it. So oh, it's, 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 it's good. Um, when the lawyers who are such good lawyers like your family members realize that it's not for them because uh, when it is for you, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful area of the law. It crosses over everything and you really have to be smart and know everything. And I must say, I am very impressed by the bench, uh, by the bar, sorry. The bench, Mm -hmm. of course, are the judges. Many of them are very good too. But I must say that most of my adversaries work hard, know the law, try very hard to give good advice, really feel committed to helping people. We are chameleons. So if one one of the parties, one of the spouses comes to me and the other spouse goes to the other one, each of us is going to wrap ourselves in our client and the glass is either half empty or half full. Both of us are going to be telling each other the truth. So it isn't as though um, they are necessarily lying to me. It's about their version of what has happened and my version. But I have a lot of respect for my colleagues at the at the bar. They work very, very hard. And I would say it's the minority. I mean, we have a we have a bad reputation. You know, lawyers uh, kill all the first thing they're going to do is kill all the lawyers. Uh, we really need the lawyers and the ones who are talented in the field of divorce and matrimonial law have very exciting professional and personal lives. My clients become my friends because we've lived through a very difficult time together, gotten to the other side of a very difficult period, whether you're the prime mover or whether you are the recipient of the news that the marriage is over, everybody has to move on and you have to, you have to be able to put together a real life afterwards. Um, and uh, I, I did want to um, uh, ask me again that question about uh, uh, being with my divorce lawyers who don't want to be divorce lawyers and lawyers who are divorce lawyers. Um, I, I was going to make one other point based on what you said, but I, I'm, uh, I lost the thread. 
So, well, let me ask you this question. In going through cases, what do you do when there's a circumstance where your client is asking for things that you know are completely unreasonable? Uh, and the root of it is a little bit more because of revenge and that they're hurt. Like, how do you talk somebody off the ledge? It's interesting that you are asking me that question because I deal with that kind of thing all the time. How do you help to create realistic expectations? And how do you help people to understand where they have to be accountable for certain things? And, uh, and it, it's an art, it's not a science. And I do it because I understand what's going on. When I, when I take a history, I take a history like you're taking today. I start a gener two generations before. Where did your grandparents come from? How about his? Uh, you know, who lives in uh, his former uh, birth family? Uh, I find out a an awful lot right away uh, about people's uh, formation, the formation of a person. And then you have to work with what you have. Uh, and they're not so much like putty. There's not that much of it that you can do to change personalities, personality disorders, fixations, motive of revenge, for example. These are very hard things to work with. I, I do uh, inquire whether there's a therapist working with somebody. Sometimes I recommend a therapist. And then I am a therapist. I'm a th I, I don't mean I'm trained to be a therapist, but over the years of my uh, uh, career, I have had to be somebody's therapist. You know, why are you saying that? Let's talk that through. Let's see whether that really uh, withstands scrutiny. I think maybe you're a little too close to it. Let's distance you a little bit from that. And what would your spouse be telling me if your spouse was sitting across from me? What is the, what, what does your spouse think is the worst thing about you that you have done? You know, and I, I explore and so on. Talking off a ledge or even helping a person to understand what's really, really going on. That's the art of, of my, of my uh, profession. That's what I'm, I'm very, very good at that. Too good. I, I'm too can, good at that. I can, I can see that. Um, so sometimes people don't like it. So, you know, I, I am, uh, I am not, I don't want to hurt anybody or be cruel. You know, like the doctors say, the first thing is do no harm, you know, the Hippocratic Oath. And I feel I have that obligation as well. So I'm careful if I have a fragile person sitting in front of me or somebody who cannot um, be told the unvarnished truth. Look, I'm hearing your side of the story, but I can understand what really was going on was X. Sometimes they're not ready to hear those kind of things. You have to feel your way. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, with, with um, the law, with divorce, there's a clock that's r r running. We're not allowed to have contingency fees here in New York for divorce. Uh, we have to do it on an hourly rate. Um, you, an hourly rate can be quite high. And a person who needs a great deal of handholding and TLC and, and advice uh, you know, people get to the point where they can't get through their day without talking to you and making sure that everything they said and did with respect to this situation, you know, the child, the spouse, uh, the partner, it's not always a marriage, uh, single sex, uh, heterosexual, it's, it's, everybody has very, very severe problems. And it can be very, very costly because uh, we have time systems that run. We see just how long the telephone call was that gets charged for. We write a letter that gets charged for. They write to you in an email in the daytime to ask you, what are they going to do about X, Y, Z? That gets charged for. So a dose of reality to the client is that um, some of what you're asking for is uh, sort of like pie in the sky. And if you go after it just to satisfy yourself that you tried to, you better be prepared to spend a lot of money with your lawyer. Mm. And what about when, and this is, I'm sure, a big part of the, of the cases when there's children involved. Yeah. Um, I've seen personally where I've thought that, that the, the two people have so much animosity yeah. and are so into hurting each other that they forget that they're the children, even though they'll be like, it's for the kids, it's for the kids. And it's like, no, it's not, it's for you. Mm -hmm. So, so 
how do you m maneuver that? And also, what about, I, I don't know if this is a reality or if this is just on TV, but what about if like the, a child is brought into court to, te to testify? I mean, that's got to be heartbreaking. Mm. So uh, to start with your last point first, uh, children are brought to court, most generally in New York, for something called a Lincoln hearing. That's supposed to be a little less hard on the child, where the child who has been appointed an attorney for the child, and so the child and the child's attorney come to court and they go into the chambers of the judge. The judge takes off the robes. There is a court reporter present. Everything that goes on back there is sealed. The parents are never allowed to know what the child said. And uh, parents are not always married to each other, but whether they're married or not married, the child is in the back room, can be for a good hour. Some judges make it easy for the child and it's not too much of a trauma. Other people never get over what happened to them in these cases. So when there is a very contested custody case, the child does end up talking to a judge. I haven't seen a child on the stand, uh, on the stand. Um, most people these days understand that a child of mature years, I would say 14 and up, that their opinion uh, really, really counts a lot. Even if it's wrong, you kind of can't take a child and, and take a square peg and put it into a round hole. If they are aligned with a parent or refusing to see another parent and, you know, talk about alienation or whatever, that's a whole other area to talk about. But uh, where a child makes the wish known, there's no point in bringing that child to court. The child at, by 18, there's no custody. So if you're talking about 14, it's going to take four years to get anywhere between court appointed forensic psychiatrists and so on. So you're quite right. This is very hard on children, but older children tend to have their say. Um, just to s switch gears a little bit. So you've had a lot of high profile cases. I have. Uh, pe people, people that we know of publicly. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Cuomo being one yes. of them. Our wonderful, wonderful client, wonderful man. Okay. Wonderful man. I represented him when he and Kerry Kennedy were divorced. And uh, he was a wonderful client and a wonderful father. The couple had had their differences, but um, he was just a sweetheart. That's, that's the Andrew Cuomo I knew. That you know. Mm -hmm. So, so it, I mean, you are, uh, you live in the state, you are, uh, you know, you are. I'm aware, resident. I'm aware of what's been going on. I, you know, I'm obviously, <clears throat> uh, I wasn't there, but uh, so much of it feels to me to be politically motivated. He hasn't told his side of the story. Mm -hmm. I hope that they work things out so that, um, so that nobody's hurt. But mm -hmm. I can tell you that the person I knew was a wonderful, capable, amazing man. Well, that, that's good to know. I mean, that's a night nice, that's that's good. That's good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And I and I, too, although I'm not a fan of po some pol policy decisions um, in terms of the situation that's going on now, uh, I do think everybody needs their day. And we really haven't heard this, you know, everything. The that's, full that's story. Right. So, so yeah. I, 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 do, only, I, I only do. know what I know. And right. I know him very, very well during the representation. Mm -hmm. And I was working with a very, very fine man. So and, I also represented mm -hmm. um, the wives of the two Weinstein brothers, oh. uh, and Harvey and Bob. So okay. I represented their wives. And, okay. Uh, uh, in those situations too, you know, we worked everything out and, uh, do you do you bring in because I was a CPA in a former life? Do you bring in accountants? Because I mean, now we're talking about always, of, right? Always, I, okay. I work with a forensic accountant. Always, mm -hmm. uh, although I myself was a math teacher. So at that point, um, after Barnard and after Bryn Mawr and after Latin and after Greek and after the four children, my first husband had some financial reverses. It was the sixties uh, when the Vietnam War was on, and it was before I went to law school. Uh, and I uh, ran out and got a New York City teacher's license and became a math teacher in the junior high schools, as they called it in those days. And I'm very, very good at math. So I'm, I'm really great with numbers and finances and so on. But I love working with accountants because if you get a good spreadsheet right away early on, you can turn all the talk and all the narrative 
into numbers. You know, I want my share. I want to be taken care of. I don't want him to walk away with the lion's share or, uh, or I don't think she's entitled to X, Y, Z. We put together a spreadsheet and I say, wait a minute, let me show you. This is what you're talking about. There's no delta here. You know, let's settle this case. It, it's, it, you're going to pay me more than the difference is, but you don't do that until you put it into the numbers. So, oh, I, I, okay. Now you're talking my language. Yes, yeah. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, uh, you are, you all, because, and then one of the other high profile cases that I read about that you did was uh, Patricia Duff, oh, who yes. was married to Ron Perlman, yes. uh, incredibly wealthy. Yes, yes. Well, you know, most of these cases with um, high profile people, there are prenuptial agreements, you know that. They, and, and, and we do a lot of prenuptial and postnuptial agreements, very popular these days, prenuptials and postnuptials. The postnuptial is very interesting because the couple is married, has been married a long time, have children, little Rocky, little Rocky, and they get uh, the sense that they're not hearing each other and so on. Sometimes a postnuptial agreement can iron out those differences, you know? Uh, I wasn't feeling secure. I wasn't sure you were telling me everything. Well, you know what? Let's put it all on a piece of paper. What we have, what your rights are, what my rights are, uh, what my obligation is from now on. I cannot make a transaction without sitting down with you and saying, this is the transaction I think I'm going to make. We're going to take things that are all in my name. We're going to put them in joint names. So a postnuptial can be a really, really healthy making a document for a marriage. It also, it describes how we're going to live now. I call that the during. What's going to happen if there's a divorce? That's the second D. And what will happen if there's a death? That's the third D. And I do a lot of postnups that have those three Ds. Mm. That's what the premaritals have too. How are we going to live if everything is intact? What's going to happen if there's a divorce? And what's going to happen if we die? And uh, the prenups tend to be sought by the have, not the have not. The have not resists it, tries to get more than the have is offering. Once in a while, you get a have who's generous and where the have not says, you don't have to negotiate this at all. This is a very fair agreement. But uh, generally, that's not where the, where the person asking for it is coming from. And uh, also, I would be remiss because, to not mention because I am a fan and I grew up watching Alice. Uh, you are oh. a good friend of Linda Lavin, who is oh, an incredible my wonderful actress, Linda. by the way. Incredible person. And uh, so I, when I read that, I was like, oh, that, that, that's exciting. Oh, she's exciting. just so wonderful. She's wonderful. Wonderful person. And, and became a very fast friend. So what? So here we are. And I mean, you're you're a wealth of information. You're incredibly bright. You've had such an interesting life. Um, you are at a point in your life, or or have been in your life for a while, where most people um, and society uh, likes to say this, uh, should be retired. Dare I say the word? I hate the word too. I agree with you. Um, you're, you've persevered. You, you, you know, you're, and I'm going to do a, a Greek thing. Spit, spit. You look amazing. <laughs> you're in good health. Spit, spit, spit. <laughs> spit, spit. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, that's how I, I can't do anything yeah. like that without doing yeah. that. I think, and, we say, I think we say over here, poo, poo. Poo, poo, poo. Yes, absolutely. Same thing. <laughs> same thing. The same thing. And so I, I, and I wanted to really talk about that as well. Um, so I, let me just two seconds, just bring it back to myself. So I had my career as a CPA. I got my MBA in finance. I worked in derivatives. And then while I was working, I always wanted to do something with the arts. And I took an improv class that morphed into acting classes that, that became one night a teacher said to me, she thought I did stand up. And I said, no. And she said, you should get some. And that was in the late nineties. And then I took a class at the comic strip at, at you know, and here I am all these years later, uh, have done acting. Uh, I do a lot of stand up comedy is my main source. Uh, the, this podcast radio hosting, I love. And um, so, I, so I've, I've also had some separate acts, didn't have any children and, 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 you know, you know, only married the one time, but um, I see for myself how difficult it is. 
Uh, I know show business also is a very aesthetic looking, youth oriented, youth obsessed world as well. Although with stand up comedy, I feel that um, being older and starting it older, I wasn't funny when I was 21. I brought experience to the table. But I'm finding in my life um, and in my contemporaries, too, that, you know, it's very hard and especially for women. And it's not like, oh, I hate men. It's nothing like that. It's a it's still a viewpoint, even even and all, and all my women comedian friends will say the same thing. You know, we'll be on a show. First of all, you'll be on a three person show or four person show. And you're usually the only women, woman. And there's a lot of women comics. So it's not like there's a shortage. And number two, you'll have somebody go, oh. Oh, I never see a woman at this club or, Oh, I haven't seen a funny woman. I mean, like these crazy, you know, mm -hmm. things that people say. So I, I'm, I'm saying all this because I want to sort of highlight that these things are still going on. Yes. Um, there's the women, but then there's the, I think the ageism is, is almost like a bigger thing because now, you know, there's a ton of women in the workforce, a lot of women CEOs. I mean, I think that's gotten much, much better, but the ageism, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't, stand it. If you want to go and move to Florida and play canasta or whatever, that's fine. Do whatever makes you happy. But not everybody is ready to pack it in at 60 or 55 or 65 or so what? So we, we're tell us where you're at with that. How have you managed to make it happen and go to everybody, basically? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's just a wonderful question. I guess uh, I should start by saying retirement used to be a goal in this country, probably in the world. People were working so they could retire. Some law firms forced their people out at 55, 65 for sure. By 75, you're not gonna find a partner uh, in, in some of the larger firms. Mandatory retirement, perhaps, except for the named founders of the firm. And these are very, very young people with a lot of experience, healthy, um, you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, Tom Brady in football, you know, they, they thought he should be retired because football players don't play till they're 42 or 43 years of age. And, and he's going to show them that a person can continue if they're in good health and have the ability and the smarts and a really smart quarterback. Um, I'm a very smart quarterback. I don't find ageism because of the following. I have my own business. I'm not in a department somewhere where somebody's going to say, uh, we need your spot for a younger person. Uh, in my view, the wisdom, the sagacity that comes, like you were just saying, Ellen, you have more knowledge now than you had when you were 21. It's fabulous when you say, I wasn't funny then. That is so profound. You got funnier because of so much that you saw in life and so much that you learned and how you knew how to interpret it because of the years. So to get rid of your sages your wise people. That was what was so great about the Oprah article. She's looking for wisdom. It's the wisdom corner is what she's calling it. And you don't get wise at 35. Just like when my sweetheart and I were in love in high school and got married and it was wonderful. I wouldn't change one minute in my life. That was the right marriage. I ended up with the right children. I ended up with enough adversity so that I would go into a fascinating other life. I think life lays itself out in a very smart way. Ageism. Part of it is that they want to make room for young people. Part of it is that the young people perhaps don't respect or older people all the time. Um, it, it's complicated. It's, it's a complicated demographic. What do you do with the old people? I think it has to be person by person. I certainly know that my chronological age and my abilities, physically, mentally, uh, emotionally, are not at the same place. I'm well aware of that. You know, people say to me, oh, my God, people 10 years younger than you, they seem like your grandmother. I understand that. And I thank God all the time. And my genetics, you know, whatever it is, the DNA that that has done this. But I just uh, I'm making it more personal. You want to talk about it more as ageism. Ageism is bad. Ageism is bad. Sexism is bad. A racism is bad. Anything. Fascism is bad. I think all the words with the ISM, they're, they're bad. They're bad. And, and it shouldn't happen. People have to be dealt with one by one. It's a separate issue than whether people have to retire 
that's a complicated issue and it's economically driven, financially driven, and, and, and it's the all about Eve syndrome, whether it's a man or a woman, somebody wants to come along and take your spot. Mm -hmm. Somebody would like to take your spot, Ellen, where you go to do stand up or this podcast. There's somebody else, maybe a person you're training who feels, well, you know what? You've done this a long time. It's their turn. Like my mom said, it's your children's turn, Harriet, not your turn. But I think there's room for all of us to have a turn. And of course, I'm very opposed to ageism. I think people just like women should have choice about their bodies. I think older people should have a choice about whether they want to continue in the paid workplace or whether they want to pursue other things. So um, obviously, I'm against it. I have not found it because I'm sort of considered to be a freak of nature. That's what people call me. Oh, Harriet, so good to you, you're a freak of nature. And then they say, you know, things like, uh, give me what she's having. What movie was that? You know, uh, Harry Sally. Sally. When, when, when Harry met Sally, uh, Harry I'll met have Sally. what she's having. So, so they'll say, I'll have what she's having, you know, and all these things. And then I say, poo poo, you know, because I don't want to be hubristic, but you're, you're interviewing me on that topic. I think people need to be respected. I think it's terrible for people over a certain age to be treated paternalistically. And uh, there is a tendency, you treat older people paternalistically, you treat patients paternalistically. I never wanna be a patient in the healthcare system. You lose your identity, you're suddenly uh, sweetie or uh, you know, grandma or um, it's terrible. So you need your autonomy. And you need to hold on to your autonomy. And I think older people have to stand up to ageism. I think they sh there needs to be a movement like there is with everything else. Oh, I'm I, wait, I'm ready to lead the protest. Okay. I can't um, I, I can't deal with it. And and I'm going to tell you a, a question that I've gotten forever. <laughs> uh, it feels like certainly since I've been in comedy uh, that I find offensive that usually has nothing to do with what we're doing. How old are you? Mm. If I say it, yeah, that's one thing. I no. never ask anybody. Right. If you tell me you wanted to, now sometimes people will tell me, right, and they'll go, "How old are you?" And I go, and I and I always say, I, "This is." I say the same thing. I'm not saying why. And mm. some some people are respect. Oh, okay, no problem. You know this and that. But I just had a situation. I have to. I have to share this. But I just had a situation of somebody that I, I didn't know from childhood, but we grew up in the same hood, and she hood neighborhood excuse me and um and uh, uh, i knew her brother anyway and she said so she asked me how old i was which was crazy because you you know and and then she goes i'm so and so and i go i go well i go well you know i, I go well, don't i don't want to say it like can't yes. you see i'm uncomfortable yes. and he was hounding me and wow. i and then later uh, then the next week i had seen one of my childhood friends and we had this conversation and i go she was always a bully she was always a bully <laughs> now even as a grown woman she's a bully she sat there with her legs spread and her white pants and a cigarette hanging out of her the same person she was when she was seven years old oh so, well know, we, just, we are we are definitely the people we were when we were seven years old no question about that this, I, we, I we do, all are i do feel i yes. still have my little spirit you know yes um, yes so yes I, I am that child i can't stand yeah. that question and if i tell you yes. what's gonna happen is you're gonna be like oh my god and it's gonna be this drama right. because i did do it a few times and i got a lot of drama and yeah. i was embarrassed yeah so yeah don't ask right if somebody wants to talk about it, that's yeah. totally fine. And, and, and let me just say this. I also think because once you say it, then, then people know, then some people, if you're still in the workforce, won't hire you. Mm -hmm. I mean, people lie on their resume all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. people are shaving off years. All I, the I think they're lying on their dating sites too. Well, <laughs> on their dating I'm sure, sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah I, I've heard that. I've heard. <laughs> well, actually, they don't update their picture. You know, it's like their high school prom picture, and then they yeah. come and yeah. you open the door, and it's Abe Vigoda. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, mean I, 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 oh. I think you got to be real with that. You know, oh, he was a, he was a sweetheart. I, he lived in the next building uh, yeah, I did, tall I slim like a toothpick <laughs> it, it was, you know when fish was walking down the down yeah the street, but, that's wonderful but i can't but you know it just makes me crazy it's like what yeah. difference well like right like people 
like I'll have a long conversation with somebody and it'll go and then they'll be like, oh, how I don't like what does it matter? Yeah. What does it matter? Yeah, yeah. We just had a nice conversation. Right. That's right. I, it's it's I find it frustrating. I find it, I'm not I, I'm I'm I am grateful. I guess well, it's I, an it's an invasion in your it privacy. Really, it really yeah. is. So for us yeah. lawyers, for us lawyers, mm -hmm. uh, it started with uh, Martindale Hubble, one one of the uh, rating uh, volumes that uh, existed before the internet. And the, one of the first things they would have, you'd have your name and where you were admitted and where you had gone to college and then DOB and your date of birth. So we lawyers have always had to uh, be open about our ages. Uh, and now on our websites, all the information is present. Yeah. I, I do think that uh, these days, I think people in their 60s and their 70s are considered to be actually in the world pretty pretty vigorous. Our uh, elected officials are those ages. Uh, the women and the men, they look, they look terrific. They don't ask people in their 60s and 70s so much. But beginning with age 80, and there are people who are still working who are almost 100, because there are certain fields where you're allowed to continue to work. For example, uh, the federal judiciary in this country. Uh, the federal judges are allowed to work until they feel that they are uh, not able to do it anymore. So they are, some of them are quite senior. But um, people think, beginning with age 80, that it's okay to say somebody how to say to somebody, how old are you? And the next line is, oh, you're amazing. You're amazing. Now, I know so many people who are in and around my age who were fortunate enough to get good genes and are still working and are and so on. And I don't think it's so amazing, but I, I do experience that a great deal. So what what you you but you I you do take care of yourself. I think yes. that also I think that is everybody's obligation. You know I get my you know I get my hair done. I do we well both I get our hair done. <laughs> I, we, we, we know where that is. Yeah. Uh, that that underground facility. Right. Uh, but but you do take care of yourself and and I I mean I I wish the way that I take care of myself now and that I have for at least a good 10, 15 years. I wish I had done that in my twenties, but I didn't, but okay, whatever. Um, but I think people have an obligation to themselves to take as good as care of yourself as possible. Absolutely. That, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you don't have a piece of chocolate cake. Cause I love chocolate cake, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the smoking, the drinking, the drugs, that it, it catches up to you. It does. It oh, just it does. does. Well, look, and if somebody wants to have an old age, they really have to stop smoking. They do. And uh, they have to stop abusing because they are going to end up with pulmonary difficulties, with heart difficulties. There's no question about it. Your body is not going to permit it forever. So if people are watching, it's very hard to stop something that you have done your whole life. But if you're going to want to enjoy um, the 80s, the 90s, which these days, that's what the obituaries are. People are dying much, much older then people should take care of themselves. You're absolutely right. What, what, so give us some tips. Like was, are there anything, uh, yoga, do you meditate, journal? What's your, you, you know, you work a lot. So well, I think my first tip is for me to work 24 <laughs> seven and to keep my brain alive. I read a lot. I read a lot. I listen to audio books on, uh, on audible on my uh, smartphone. Uh, and I, um, read, I read all of the newspapers every single day. I get up early in order to be able to um, absorb the newspapers, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal before I go to work every single day. And I, you know, I take the extra hour in the morning before I leave my home to do that. Um, very, very active um, day and night. Uh, I, don't, I, I need eight hours of sleep. I feel sleep is very, very important, but if I have to have a shorter night, then I try to catch up on that on a weekend. At some point I have to catch up so that I don't feel tired. I never feel tired. I'm lucky that I'm a very energetic person. I'm, never, I'm not tired, but I sleep well. So it's good to sleep well. I don't take medications. I haven't had to, uh, but I think people who need their medications in order to uh, keep their arteries open and, and uh, to keep their heart working, they should be uh, religious about taking them. I think that if people need to take their medication for personality disorders, mood disorders, they should be religious about taking them. Now, you haven't heard me say anything about exercise or going <laughs> to a fitness place. It's not my thing. 
uh, but I walk a lot because of the fact that I walk around my office and I walk to the co- into the court and I stand when I'm uh, trying the case. I don't sit down. I like to stand up when I'm giving a talk and that's what I do. No yoga, stretching, anything nope. of that nature? Nothing like that. No. Mm-hmm. I, lo- I, love a, I love an occasional massage. It's very wonderful. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. What about uh, a diet? What's, uh, what's sort of your... your uh, well, I'm, I'm very um, compassionate and empathetic about people with weight problems. Mm-hmm. I believe it is very, very difficult to shed weight because we have to eat. Uh, I have done a lot of reading about uh, the surgery uh, and uh, obesity. I believe that the surgery is considered to be very, very healthy and lengthens people's lives if they are struggling with obesity. Uh, As far as normal overweight, a lot of parts of the country, people are more on the overweight side. I think those of us in Manhattan uh, tend to go for the slimmer model, Uh, very careful. I don't drink too much. Um, I find that if you have uh, even um, wine every single night, it puts pounds on you. So it's a good idea probably to curtail that. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I have not been a person who has uh, jogged or taken long, long walks, but I applaud the people who do. Uh, What's your your vice? Uh, Sweet, savory, uh, meat, <laughs> tuna fish with mayonnaise, tuna fish with delicious. <laughs> oh, on toast. Oh, oh, yeah, maybe with a little avocado and Swiss cheese oh, on it. Oh, no. so so I if I am going for a, a mouthful of tuna fish with mayonnaise, <laughs> I'm in trouble. So that's my red light. That's my red light uh, food. That's pretty. That's, <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And and you have to be careful about the peanut butter and jelly jar with the spoon. Yeah. That's not. That's that's a bad one too. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. for me. Not for me. Uh, but for one of my daughters. One of my daughters <laughs> confesses from time to time that she binged on peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> Get it? No, I love. I love the sweet stuff. Yeah. Um, and also, you have grandchildren. We we didn't address. You have. You have. How many grandchildren do you have? I I do. I have grandchildren. I have great grandchildren as well. I mean, oh. you are like. <laughs> who would want you as their grandmother or their great grandmother? I mean, that's just like <laughs> wisdom. And let me well, say, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, my grandchildren and I. Uh, it's interesting that you mention it. My grandchildren and I are very, very, very close, one-on-one. That's and, great. Uh, and we are, I, I would say the relationship is a little different than a grandma, grandchild. I think that, uh, so I have grandchildren who have written books. I've been one of the people who uh, uh, vetted the book, read the book, you know, marked up the book. I'm a very good computer operator. I, I do uh, Word and, and the track changes, you know, I do it fast. So um, we're, we're sort of, uh, intellectually, uh, we stay kind of on the same wavelength with each other. Obviously, they teach me a lot when they write a book in the economics field, you know, pretty hard for me to read it, but I read it. And then I get, you know, feedback from them on what is it they were trying to say here and there. Yeah, so I'm very close with my children and with my grandchildren. It's, my it's, daughter is a doctor. I have, I have, my third daughter is a physician. My fourth daughter is also a lawyer, but she's out of town. She practices law out of town. My grandchildren are um, very accomplished as well. So we've been, we've been um, blessed. We've been blessed. That, that is just so wonderful. I, I, I also was blessed with wonderful, grand, two beautiful grandmothers, smart. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And uh, I also knew my great grandmother, Mm. And and it, uh, now that I've sort of uh, finished, I was working on a documentary that I finished editing, although there's some work to do. It's actually about New York City and in COVID. Um, but I have to pick up the play about my great grandmother. She came through Ellis Island and that story. And uh, I have to get that. I have to get that mm. out there somehow, some way, somehow. Um, so but I will also uh, I also had a, a great relationship. And I think that 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 grandparent relationship and you know not everybody's lucky to have known their grandparents and 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 all that um but if you do it's it's wonderful and i was also 
happy because we all lived in, you know, the tri the New Jersey, New York area. So mm -hmm. we're, you know, we didn't, we were, we're Greek anyway. Greeks don't move away. You know, it's just yeah, right. not what we do. Same, same okay. with us. Same right. with us. Okay. <laughs> um, I can't, I, I, you've been such a pleasure. I, I can speak to you forever. Um, thank, thank you. you. So like much. I was going to say the same, Ellen, you're a very, very gifted interviewer. Oh. And, um, and, and it was a real joy for me to talk with you. Uh, you helped me to think about some things that uh, I don't generally have time to do. You know, I think about the grandparents and the grandchildren of my of my clients, mm -hmm. and I live through them every day. And I very rarely can think about myself. So you gave me a real opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I would love maybe some time to have, uh, I don't know if you go to lunch or dinner, uh, but I'd love to meet you one day. I think That'd that it would just be fun and we could talk, you know. And I, I see you have uh, a wonderful background. You're in front of the, uh, the ball, I guess. You're in Times Square. Is that your office? Is that? No, my, my office overlooked that for a long, long time. And I'm just, I'm in Times Square too. You have your virtual Times Square behind <laughs> you and I'm actually in my Times Square office. So there we are. We are, uh, we have a lot of, a lot in common. Thank you so much, uh, you. Harriet Cohen, yes. Yes. extraordinaire, attorney, mother, grandmother. Great so let me just mother. say the name of my law firm. Yes, please. I, think I said that. Yeah. Yes. So my law, and I'm going to say one thing about it. My yes. law firm is Cohen. Stein, mm -hmm. S-T-I-N-E, Kapoor, K-A-P-O-O-R, L-L-P, and we're at Times Square. And my partner Stein is my oldest daughter. My partner Kapoor is a young man of Indian descent who went to my law school and uh, found me and um, I fell in love with him and he became my partner uh, and he's wonderful. Uh, not to mention very, very handsome. <laughs> and, um, and we're having a, a very um, thrilling time practicing law here together with the most fascinating life problems that we help people solve. So uh, if anybody is in need of assistance, doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the finality, uh, but uh, Mrs. Cohen and her law firm uh, is is available it's funny usually i have a comic on and i'm like so go to their show and <laughs> so there's a whole different there's a whole different way to end the show right uh, right but, right uh, so we'll go to your show and they'll come to me if they have if they need an ear exactly and, and a legal and a legal and legal advice exactly okay. thank, thank you so me. much ellen thank you my name is ellen karras uh follow me on instagram and twitter at greek chick comic facebook ellen karras greek goddess comedy or go to my website ellen for this podcast and all of the other ones that we've had for six seasons everybody and uh and again uh thank you so much for listening till next time bye